Prepare to be amazed because not everyone who works amongst us as human beings are what they seem. In today's video, we will uncover the mystery of one of such creatures and their secrets might just leave you speechless. The first thing everyone noticed about Amaka was her eyes. They were too sharp, too bright, like twin blades of glass slicing through the fog of normalcy that's blanketed in Teresa's secondary school. She was new, of course, having just transferred in the middle of the term, and with her sudden arrival came a shift in the air. Though none of the students could pinpoint exactly what it was, still they whispered behind her back, curious and suspicious. For a girl as quiet as Amaka, gossip filled the silence that followed her like a shadow. Her parents couldn't afford her old school. That's why she's here. Chioma sneered, running a perfectly manicured finger over her lip gloss. She acts like she's better than us, added Ifunaya with a flip of her braids. But there was something more, something beneath the surface that none of them wanted to admit. Even if I, the class clown, who usually had a joke for everything, had been unnervingly silent since her arrival. Amaka had caught him staring at her once, her lips curled into a half smile, and he finally had felt his heart skip a bit. But it wasn't the kind of flutter people talk about in romance novels. No, this was something else, something cold. He had looked away quickly, but even then, the sensation of her gaze burned into the back of his neck. Who does she think she is? Chioma had asked, her eyes narrowing, coming here like she's some queen. They had seen Amaka for what they thought she was, a poor, odd girl, out of place in the polished halls of their elite secondary school. And because of that, she became a target, a target they didn't know they shouldn't touch. It started small, as most cruelty does, a nudge in the hallway, a side comment, a sub to show. What way of going, Amaka? If Unaya hissed one day, when Amaka brushed past her, there had been no need to push her, no need to whisper insults under her breath. But if Unaya did it anyway, because she could, Amaka didn't react. She never did. She just moved on as if nothing had happened. Her dark braids bouncing subtly on her shoulders. Her lack of response infuriated them. It was Wednesday afternoon and the school was preparing for the annual sports competition. Amaka had gone to change in the locker room, away from the others, hoping for a moment of peace. But Chioma, Ifunaya, and a few others followed her in. They didn't say anything at first. They just watched her from a corner of the room, whispering among themselves, their eyes glittering with cruel anticipation. Just as Amaka was about to leave, Ifunaya stepped forward, blocking her path. Hey, where did you get those shoes? She asked, her voice lifted with mock sweetness. Oh wait, let me guess. Second hand, they look old. The group laughed, circling around her. Chioma, always the leader, smiled coldly. I think we should help you out, you know, since you're so quiet. Maybe you need a little attention. Before Amaka could respond, Ifunaya reached out and pulled at her braids. Tugging hard enough that Amaka winced. Oops, she said, laughing. Did that hurt? Still, Amaka stayed silent. She met Ifunaya's gaze steadily, but her silence only seemed to provoke them further. One of the girls tipped over Amaka's spot bar, spilling its contents across the floor. Her water bottle rolled away, clattering loudly in the empty room. Say something, freak, Choma challenged, her voice now harder, her eyes sharper. Or are you too scared? Amaka bends down, gathering her things with slow, deliberate movements. She was like a shadow, always there, but never making a sound. The others exchanged uneasy glances, suddenly uncomfortable with her composure. Even Shoma's mocking smile faltered for a moment, but she quickly recovered. Let's go, Shoma finally said, tossing her head over her shoulder. She's not worth it. Chioma, Ifunaya, and the rest of their clique had perfected the art of bullying under the rudder. St. Teresa's was a Catholic school, and outwardly, they had to maintain an image of perfect discipline and decorum, so they made sure their cruelties were quiet, unseen by teachers, and just subtle enough 
that they could always deny any wrongdoing. But they weren't as unseen as they thought. Amaka slips would switch ever so slightly each time, her hands folding and unfolding at her sides, like something was crawling just beneath her skin. They didn't notice, or if they did, they brushed it off as a strange behavior. After all, Amaka was weird. But Ifai began to notice something off. It started when he found Chioma crying in the bedroom one afternoon. Chioma never cried. She was too tough, too full of venom herself. I, I saw something, she whispered shakily when he finally asked what was wrong. Saw what, he asked, half laughing. A ghost? No. Ha, Chioma said, her voice dropping into a tremor. Amaka, I saw her eyes. Change. Change? He finally frowned, now genuinely curious. What do you mean change? They... Chioma hesitated, then shook her head, as if trying to shake off the memory. Never mind. Just forget I said anything. But he finally couldn't, and he wasn't the only one who felt something off. Strange things started happening after that. Small, unexplainable events at first, like objects going missing. Pencils, textbooks, a pair of shoes. If I his pen would roll off his desk and disappear into thin air, only to show up in the most unlikely places later, as if someone had deliberately moved them to mess with him. Then came the snakes. It started when Ifunaya found one coiled in her locker. It was a small snake, harmless, but the sight of it had sent her into hysterics. She screamed until her voice cracked, her heart pounding in her chest as she imagined those sharp fangs sinking into her skin. The girls had laughed it off later, calling it a prank. But Ifunaya wasn't laughing. She was shaking. It's just a coincidence, Chioma said dismissively. Someone put it there as a joke. It has nothing to do with her. Still, whenever Amaka passed by, Ifunaya couldn't shake the feeling that there was something strange about her. As the days dragged on, more snakes started appearing slithering out from under desks, wriggling out of cracks in the walls, even emerging from under breath in the dormitories. The whole school was on edge, and yet, no one could link it back to Amaka. No one except Tiffany. He had seen the way she moved through the halls, her steps silent, as though she were gliding instead of walking. He noticed how the snakes seemed to appear wherever she went. He hadn't mentioned it to anyone yet, but he could feel something terrible was about to happen, something none of them were prepared for. It was during one of the school's mandatory assemblies, a Friday afternoon, when the heat from the sun seemed to be pressing down on the earth itself. The students sat in neat rows, their heads bowed as the priest led prayers, but no one was paying attention. Amaka sat alone in the back, her hands folded neatly on her lap, her face expressionless, as she stared at the priest. Ifani, sitting three rows ahead of her, could feel the weight of her stare. It was heavy and oppressive. He tried to ignore it. He tried to focus on the priest's droning voice, but something was wrong. The air was thick, just like the moments before a thunderstorm. Then it happened. Without warning, Choma stood up, her face twisted in confusion. She started to scratch at her arms, then her neck, her fingers clawing at her skin like she was trying to rip something off. Her mouth opened in a silent scrape as red welts began to rise along her hands. Chioma, if Maya whispered, eyes wide with horror. I, I can't breathe. Chioma choked out, her voice hoarse. Her hand went to her throat and before anyone could move, before anyone could think to help, she collapsed to the floor, convulsing violently. Panic erupted. Students scrambled to their feet, shouting and running in every direction as the teachers rushed to Chioma's side. But it was already too late. The look in her eyes, wide and terror-stricken, was enough to tell them that. Ifani's blood ran cold as he watched from a distance. He felt it there, like a storm building inside him. It wasn't Chioma's sudden collapse that filled him with dread. It was Amaka. She hadn't moved. She hadn't flinched. She sat there, watching. And when she finally stood, her lips curved into a soft, knowing smile. Something inside the fine 
screamed at him to run, to get away. But he was frozen in place, his feet rooted to the ground, as Amaka's gaze found his. It was then that he understood what was really going on. As the chaos unfolded, Ifai couldn't shake the realization, clawing at his brain. Amaka wasn't normal. She had never been. She wasn't just a new girl or a victim of cruel bullying. She was something else, something none of them had realized. The teachers, baffled and panicked, ordered the students back to their dormitories, leaving Chioma's convulsing body behind to be taken care of by the school nurse. But Amaka knew that there was no nurse in the world who could fix what had happened. That night, he finally found himself staring at the ceiling of his dormitory, unable to sleep. His mind raced, piecing together the strange event that had happened since Amaka arrived. The snakes, the eyes, the way she never reacted, as though she knew everything that was happening was part of a plan only she understood. Suddenly, a rustling sound reached his ears. He turned his head, his heart pounding in his chest. There, in the corner of the room, stood Amaka. Her eyes gleamed in the darkness, reflecting the faint moonlight that filtered through the window. Her lips parted, and for the first time since she had arrived, she spoke. Do you know what they used to call me where I come from? She asked, her voice soft, almost musical. He finally shook his head, too terrified to respond. They call me Akende, the mother of snakes. She whispered, her words sliding like silk. Do you know why? He finally throat went dry. His mind screamed for him to run, but his body refused to obey. Because snakes never forget, she said, taking a step closer. They never forget a slight threat. Amaka continued, her voice chillingly calm. The words coiling around Ifai like a loose tightening with each syllable. And they never forgive. Ifai's skin crawled as she stepped closer. Her figure cast a shadow. Only her glowing eyes cutting through the darkness. Every instinct in his body told him to get up, to run, to scream for help. But something held him in place. A primal fear that paralyzed his limbs. Chioma, Ifunaya, all of you. Amaka whispered, circling him like a predator, sizing up its prey. You thought you were safe, that your cruel little games had no consequences. The room felt suffocating, as though the very walls were closing in on him. His heart beat pounded in his ears, the terror rising in his chest. What do you want? He stammered, finally finding his voice though it was a little more than a hoarse whisper. Amaka stopped, her face inches from his, her breath cold against his skin. I want what I've always wanted, she said, her voice a deadly whisper, to watch you all pay for what you've done to me. With that, she smiled a slow, deliberate smile that revealed too many teeth, teeth that were too sharp, too pointed like fangs. If I he blinked, his mind, refusing to comprehend what he was saying. No, it couldn't be real. This was some twisted nightmare. But the longer he stared into her eyes, the more he realized the truth. Amaka was something inhuman. The air in the room seemed to ticket, charged with an unnatural energy. He finally felt a creepy sensation that slid along his spine, as though the very air around him was alive. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw it. Something slithering out of the shadows. A snake. Its scales shimmered under the moonlight as it curled around the leg of his bed. Its forked tongue flickering in and out. He finally his blood ran cold. He hadn't moved. Hadn't made a sound. But the snake turned its head towards him as though sensing its fear. Amaka's voice cut through the silence. They know, you see. They know who to follow. Who to trust. Her gaze flicked to the snake, then back to him. They know their own. The snake was too close. He finally scrambled backward, his body finally reacting to the terror flooding his veins. His legs tangled in the bed sheets as he crashed to the floor. His breathing ragged and panicked. He glanced up, expecting Amaka to be standing over him, but she had vanished. Only the faint hiss of the snake remained. He bolted for the door, yanking it open and rushing down the hallway. His mind screaming at him, to get as far away from her as possible. His feet pounded against the floor, echoing through the empty corridors, 
But no matter how fast he ran, he couldn't say the feeling that she was right behind him. He burst into Ifunaya's dormitory, gasping for breath. She and the other girls jolted awake, startled by the sudden intrusion. Ifunaya, Ifanyi wheezed, clutching the door frame. Amaka, she's not, she's not normal. We need to leave now. Ifunaya sat up, rubbing her eyes. What are you talking about? She snapped, irritation lacing her voice. It's the middle of the night. How did you get here? You don't understand. Ifanyi insisted, his voice trembling. She's, she's not human. She's a snake. At the mention of the word snake, Ifunaya froze. Her face paled as the memory of the snake in her locker resurfaced. You're crazy, she said, though there was a flicker of fear in her eyes. It's just some stupid prank. Before Ifanyi could respond, a sudden movement in the shadows of the room caught his attention. He turned, his heart leaping into his throat. It was another snake. It slithered out from under Ifunaya's bed, its long, sleek body winding toward her. The girl screamed leaping onto the bed in a frantic attempt to get away from it. If Naya's voice cracked as she yelled, what the hell is going on? But before anyone could answer, the snake launched. The snake struck with terrifying speed, sinking its fangs into If Naya's ankle before she could react. Her scream pierced the air as she collapsed onto the floor, clutching her leg in agony. The venom worked fast, too fast. Her body convulsed, her eyes wide with horror as her skin began to pale. Ifanyi watched, paralyzed by fear, as the other girls backed away, their faces pale with shock. No one moved. No one dared to help her. Someone, help me. Ifunaya gasped, her voice weak, but they all stood frozen in place, too terrified to approach. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, her body went still. Her chest no longer rose and filled with breath. The room was deathly quiet. Ifanyi took a shaky step backward, bow rising in his throat. This couldn't be happening. This wasn't real. But there she was, lying lifeless on the cold floor, her eyes staring blankly into the sea. She's dead, one of the girls whispered, her voice trembling. No, Ifanyi muttered. No, no, no. But even as he spoke, he felt it. The cold certainty that if Naya wasn't the first and she wouldn't be the last, this was just the beginning. As if to confirm his worst fears, a low mocking voice drifted from the shadows near the door, a voice only he could hear. They thought they could escape. Amaka said softly, her figure emerging from the darkness, but there is no escape. She stepped into the light, her face away, her eyes gleaming with something dark and malevolent. She looked down at Ifunaya's lifeless body and smiled. A slow, satisfied smile that sent chills to the room. You should have left me alone, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Now you all suffer. The school erupted into chaos the next day. Ifunaya's death couldn't be explained, at least not in any rational way. The teachers and administrators tried to cover it up, claiming she had suffered a sudden seizure. But the students knew better. The whispers spread like wildfire. It's her, Amaka. She did something. I heard she's a snake. Ifanyi listened to the rumors as he walked through the courtyard, his mind racing. He knew the truth. He had seen Amaka for what she truly was. And now, there was no denying it. The other students were afraid, but they still didn't understand the full scope of the danger they were in. Amaka wasn't just a snake. She was vengeance itself and she wasn't finished. He had to do something. He had to stop her before more people died. That night, he found Chioma huddled in the chapel, her face pale and drawn, her hands shaking as she whispered prayers under her breath. Chioma, he said, approaching her cautiously, we need to talk. She looked up at him, her eyes wide with fear. If I, I, I didn't know what's happening. I keep seeing her. In my dreams, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Ifanyi swallowed hard, glancing around to make sure no one else was listening. It's real. All of it, Amaka. She's some kind of snake spirit or demon. I don't know, but she's not human. Chioma's breath hitched. 
her fingers tightening around the rosary in her hands. What do we do? How do we stop her? If Fanny shook his head, I don't know, but we have to find a way. Before they could speak any further, the sound of footsteps echoed through the chapel. They both turned, their hearts pounding as the marker's figure appeared in the doorway. She smiled at them, a slow, deliberate smile. There's no use running, she said softly. I'm everywhere. The following days were a blow of terror. Most students fell victim to the snakes, some beaten, others plagued by hallucinations that drove them mad. The school was crumbling under the weight of fear and confusion, but Amaka moved through the chaos with eerie calm. It didn't take long for rumors to escape the walls of St. Teresa, reaching the media. The headlines screamed chaos. The school's reputation, once spotless, was now tainted by fear and suspicion. In the days following Ifunaya's death, four other students had been hospitalized after reporting seeing snakes slithering under their beds or feeding invisible fangs sinking into their skin. Two of them died within hours of reaching the hospital. The news spread like wildfire through the community. Parents, horrified by the stories, rushed to withdraw their children from school. The school's administrative office was flooded with calls, angry parents demanding answers, mothers and fathers pulling their children out of class, unwilling to wait for another tragedy. In the principal's office, Mr. Uche sat behind his desk, his fingers gripping the arms of his chair tightly. His usually calm, commanding presence had been shattered by the chaos unraveling around him. The teachers, equally confused and frightened, gathered in his office, their faces pale and grown. This has to stop, Mr. Uche said, his voice barely above a whisper. We can't lose any more students. But how do we stop it when we don't even know what it is? One of the teachers, Mrs. Okafor, asked, her voice trembling. It's these damn snakes. Another teacher, Mr. Ade, burst out. We need to get pest control in here. Bring in professionals to come to the entire school. We've already done that, Mr. Uche replied, his voice straight. They found nothing, no nest, no signs of snakes anywhere on the property. Mrs. Okafor rubbed her temples, visibly distressed. This isn't just about snakes. It's something else, something we can't explain. There was silence for a moment as they all exchanged glances, their minds racing through the superstition and old stories they had grown up with. None of them dared say it, but they were all thinking the same thing. Something unnatural was happening at St. Teresa, and the mother, sitting quietly in the back of her classroom, was watching it all unfold. By the end of the week, the exodus began in earnest. Cars lined up outside the school gates as worried parents arrived to collect their children, some without so much as a goodbye to their teachers. They were desperate to escape the school's curse before it claimed another life. If Fanny watched as friends he had known for years packed their bags, their faces a mix of relief and fear. He had overheard a few conversations in hushed tones. I can't keep my children here. Not after what happened to some of the students. A mother whispered to another, casting a nervous glance over her shoulder. I heard the found another dead girl in the dormitory last night, said a father, shaking his head as he ushered his daughter into the car. This school is being haunted. Something is not right. The school, once filled with the lively chatter of students, now felt more like a graveyard. Desks sat empty in the classrooms. Hallways that used to buzz with activity were eerily silent and the few students who remained walked with a haunted look in their eyes. If Fanny couldn't sleep, even if he wanted to, something kept him rooted to the ground. He felt responsible. Somehow, this was connected to him. He had seen the signs, the warnings, and the trips no one else dared to acknowledge. Amaka wasn't human. She was something born of darkness, and she was enacting her revenge. He knew time was running out. He had gathered what little information he could, Digging through old myths and legends, late into the night, he discovered tales of a vengeful snake goddess, Ekenne, who was said to take human form to punish those who wronged her. The stories were vague, but they all ended the same way. Death and destruction for those who crossed her path. It was clear now that Amaka wasn't just a girl seeking revenge. 
she was something far more dangerous, something ancient and worthful. But how do you stop something that isn't human? How do you defeat a dark creature that lives and breathes in the shadows? Let's find out. If Ifani spends his night researching, poring over old folklore, scanning the internet for stories of snake deities and vengeful spirits. The name Ekenne came up again and again, an ancient spirit said to dwell in the bodies of snakes, punishing those who offended her or disrupted her domain. It was on a particularly sleepless night, hunched over a stack of old books in the school library, that Ifani came across the story that sent a shiver down the spine. It was buried deep in the pages of a dusty old volume about Nigerian mythology, one he had almost skipped over entirely. The legend spoke of a way to banish a kenne. The spirit could only be banished when it revealed its true form, a full transformation into the snake it once was. But to force it into such a state, the spirit needed to be publicly exposed in front of others, where it would be vulnerable, stripped of its human disguise. And there lay the dilemma. How could he make Amaka reveal herself in front of everyone? And even then, would the other students and teachers believe what they were seeing? Still, it was the only need he had. With the plan slowly forming in his mind, he finally knew he had no choice but to act. Time was running out, and if he didn't stop Amaka soon, more students would die. He had to force her hand to make her transform in front of everyone and expose the truth before it was too late. But Amaka was cunning. She had been hiding her true nature all this time, weaving through the chaos she created like a snake slipping through the grass. Ifani would have to be even smarter and faster if he hoped to outwit her. The next morning, Ifani walked into the classroom with a new sense of purpose. His plan was risky, possibly fatal, but it was all he had. The room was eerily quiet. Only a handful of students remained, most of them huddled in small groups, whispering about the deaths and illnesses that had plagued the school. Amaka sat in the back, as always, her eyes following Ifai as she took his seat. He could feel her gaze, cold and calculating. He had to act fast. During the break, Ifai slipped away, making his way to the school's assembly hall. The hall was large capable of holding the entire student's body and staff. A perfect place for what he had planned. He would need an audience. The more witnesses, the better. He hurried to the public address system, his hands shaking slightly as he fumbled with the microphone. His voice, though trembling at first, echoed through the speakers. Everyone, please come to the assembly hall immediately. There's something urgent you need to see. His message was vague just enough to pique everyone's curiosity without revealing too much. He knew that if he made it sound like an emergency, they would all come running. Within minutes, students, teachers, and staff began filing into the hall, murmuring against themselves, wondering what was happening. The tension was palpable, the air thick with unease. And then, Amaka arrived. She stepped into the hall, her eyes narrowing as she scanned the crowd quickly locking into Ifai. He felt a chill run down his spine, but he stood his ground. This was it. This was his only chance. Amaka, he called out, his voice ringing across the hall. The crowd fell silent, all eyes turning towards him. Amaka tilted her head slightly, a faint smile playing on her lips. What is this about, Ifai? She asked, her voice as calm as ever. He took a deep breath his heart pounding in his chest. Everyone here needs to know the truth. You're not what you say you are. You're not human. Admit it. A ripple of confusion swept through the crowd, but Amaka's expression didn't change. She remained eerily calm, her gaze fixed on him. You think you can stop me, don't you? She whispered, loud enough for only him to hear, but her breath sent a shiver through his bones. I know what you are, Amaka. If I said, loud at this time, addressing the entire hall, she is a Kenne, the mother of snakes. She's been behind all of this, the deaths, the sicknesses. She's been punishing us. Gasp echoed through the hall as the students and teachers 
exchanged bewildered glances. Some laughed nervously, clearly thinking it was a joke. Others looked at a marker with suspicion, the pieces slowly falling into place. You don't know what you're playing with to find, Amaka said, her voice now laced with menace. She took a step closer, her smile faded, replaced with something darker. But you're about to find out, and you'll regret it. Suddenly, the air in the hall grew heavy, charged with an electric energy that sent everyone on earth. Amaka's skin began to shimmer, and before the crowd's disbelieving eyes, her body started to change. Her limbs twisted and lengthened unnaturally as her bones cracked and shifted beneath her skin. Gasp and horrified whispers rippled to the assembly hall, but no one dared move. The teachers were frozen in place, their eyes wide with shock. Students clutched each other, too terrified to believe what they were seeing. Amaka's skin shimmered in the dim light, taking on a glossy, scale-like texture. Her eyes, those sharp piercing eyes, turned a deep unnatural green, the pupils narrowing into slits, her once calm human face, twisted into something monstrous. Run! Ifani shouted, but no one could move. The fear was too paralyzing. The sight, too surreal. Amaka's transformation continued as her lower half began to melt into a massive coiling snake's tails that glimmered under the harsh light of the hawk. She rose taller and taller, her body uncoiled until she stood, towering over them all, half woman, half serpent. The crowd erupted into chaos. Students screamed and stumbled over one another, scrambling to get away from the monstrous creature before them. Teachers rushed toward the exit, shouting orders, but it was future. The assembly hall had become a prison, and Amaka was the warden. Now you see, she hissed, her voice, an eerie blend of human and reptilian. Now you understand what you've provoked. She slid out forward, her massive curls writhing on the ground, eyes scanning the crowd for her next victim. Her forked tongue flickered in and out, as though tasting the fear in the air. You all thought you could bully me and get away with it. She hissed, her voice echoing through the hall. But this is my revenge. For every cruel word, every show, every whisper behind my back, you all will pay. A sharp, paralyzing silence fell over the crowd. Even those who had tried to run were now glued to their spots, staring in horror at the vengeful creature that had once been their classmate. If I had found it in his chest, knew this was his only chance, the moment of transformation was the moment of weakness. His research had told him that while Amaka was in a true form, she was vulnerable, but only if the truth was laid bare before everyone. I know why you're doing this, he shouted, his voice cracking as he stood his ground. But this is not the way. You're destroying everyone, even those who didn't hurt you. Amaka's serpentine body froze, her slitted eyes narrowing dangerously as she fixed her gaze on him. You speak as though you understand, she hissed, her voice dripping with venom. But you know nothing if I... Her tail lashed out suddenly, striking the ground near Ifani's feet with terrifying force, sending chunks of tap flying through the air. He stumbled back, but didn't retreat. No! He shouted, his voice gaining strength. This has to end. You've been wronged, but killing everyone won't fix that. Amaka recalled slightly, as though his words had struck a nerve. For a brief moment, the furious gleam in her eyes faltered and a flicker of something else, pain, grief, crossed her monstrous face. The crowd, still terrified, watched in stunned silence. You can't erase the past, if I continued, his voice steady as he stepped closer. But you can stop this cycle of suffering. You've shown them your power. Now let them go. Please. Amaka's eyes flashed dangerously, and for a moment, it seemed as though she might strike again. But then, the tension in her body eased slightly, her massive coils shifting restlessly on the floor. The hall was deathly silent. As the students and teachers watched, too afraid to move, but unable to look away, Amaka's gaze drifted over the terrified faces before her, and something inside her seemed to change. Her towering form 
seemed to deflate slightly, the menace in her eyes replaced by something else, something more tragic. She had lived for this moment, for this revenge, but now that it was within her grasp, the weight of it pressed down on her like an unbearable burden. I, Amaka's voice trembled, I never wanted this. Her serpentine body curled tighter around itself, and for the first time, the creature that had terrorized St. Teresa looked lost, conflicted. For a brief, heart-stopping moment, Ifani thought he had reached that, that somehow he had broken through the wall of vengeance that had consumed her. The students watched in stunned disbelief, unable to comprehend what they were seeing. But then, in the flicker of an instant, Amaka's expression twisted again, this time into one of pure, unbridled rage. Her eyes blazed and her coil stares once more, ready to strike. No, she hissed, her voice turning cold, venomous. You all must pray. Before Ifani could react, Amaka lunged, her massive tail whipping across the room with deadly force. He barely dodged the strike, stumbling backward as the ground shattered where he had stood. Chaos erupted once more as students screamed, rushing towards the exit. But Amaka's massive curls blocked their escape, trapping them in the hall. There was no way out. Just as Ifai prepared to face her in pain, knowing fully well that he had little chance of survival, the air around him began to shimmer. He blinked, confused, but then realized the books he read had mentioned this. The moment Amaka revealed her true form, her power would be weakened and she would become vulnerable. A low, eerie hum filled the room as Amaka's monstrous form flickered like an image, struggling to maintain its shape. Her eyes darted around, realizing what was happening. No, she shrieked, her voice panicked. No, not now, not when I'm so close. But it was too late. Her form began to disintegrate, her body flickering between the human and the serpent. The crowd watched, mesmerized, as her once powerful curls dissolved into smoke, leaving only the faintest trace of her presence behind. Ifani stood frozen, staring at the spot where Amaka had been. The room was deathly quiet. The students and teachers, still in shock, slowly began to process what they had just witnessed. It was over. Amaka was gone. But as Ifani let out a shaky breath, a faint whisper drifted through the air, so quiet he almost didn't hear it. This isn't over, Ifani. He froze, his blood running cold. Somewhere in the shadows, a pair of slitted eyes gleamed at him. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this story, I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. It's about a secondary school girl who slept with her teachers for good grades. Thank you for watching.